Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. In fact, it all started with a fish. Uh, it was in about 1970. I was five or six years old, uh, living in West London with my family, and my dad decided that it was time for his boy to have his first fishing trip. Not a great many fishing opportunities in West London, <laughs> but he decided we could hop on the bus and venture all the way to Richmond Park, where he knew there was a little stream that had taken his fancy. And 70s dad took with him a sort of classic 1930s boy's own fishing kit that he'd sort of uh, rummaged together. A long bamboo cane, a piece of string, and a bent pin. It, it really was that proverbial, honestly and a couple of slices of mother's pride for bait. <laughs> I was a pretty reluctant companion on this trip. I think I was going to miss Scooby-Doo and Captain Scarlet on the telly. <laughs> uh, and when we actually got there, and he unfurled this kit with a flourish and squidged a bit of white bread on the pin and dipped it in this little stream, I realized he completely lost his mind. <laughs> This looked to me like the most hopeless activity I could possibly think of. And within about 30 seconds, I was complaining that I was bored. He insisted, though, that we were in with a great chance, but that fishing was a waiting game, and I needed to be a little patient. Or if I preferred, I could just wander down the bank a bit and maybe look under a few stones, see if I could find a juicy worm. That might be an even better bait than Mother's Pride. And so I did, so I wandered off, and it wasn't long, barely a minute, I think, before he said, Hugh, quick, come back. We've got one. And I turned round, and there was my dad with the rod in his hand, wrestling with some monster of the deep in this little stream. Anyway, I, I was there in a flash, grabbed the rod out of his hand and heaved. And to my amazement, out of this stream flew a very respectable-looking fish that landed on the bank. My dad made a lunge for it, picked up a nearby stick, knocked it on the head, and handed it to me. <coughs> well done, he said. You've caught your first fish. Of course, I was, I was beaming with pride. I felt as good as if he'd actually handed me a Captain Scarlet Action Man doll. <laughs> Maybe even better. So we went home and told my mum about the epic battle on the, the banks of a stream in Richmond Park. And we got out the Observer's Book of Fishes, and identified this fish, and it turned out to be a mackerel. <laughs> I was a little baffled, because I could see from the pictures and the little description that this, this was a, a fish that was largely reputed to live in the sea. <laughs> but my dad, you know, omniscient dad, as, as all dads are when you're that age, had a quite brilliant explanation. He said, well, this fish must have swum up the Thames <laughs> and taken a wrong turn <laughs> and ended up in a stream in Richmond Park. And we were just lucky enough to be there when it happened. <laughs> and, you know, this was more than good enough for me. And even as he was telling me this, my mother was frying up the fish in a pan with butter, garlic, maybe a bay leaf. And that wonderful smell was filling my nostrils. And she presented it to me on a plate. No chips, no adornment. Probably the first bit of fish I'd ever seen that wasn't covered in day-glow orange breadcrumbs and slathered in ketchup. And I tucked in. And it was a wonderful thing and a very, very memorable meal. But it was 10 years, I was nearly 15, when the truth about that day finally emerged. <laughs> Because I was talking with some teenage friends of mine who were also quite into fishing. And for the umpteenth time, they were listening to me brag about this extraordinary escapade, how I'd caught a mackerel in a stream <laughs> in Richmond Park. And I brushed aside their skepticism and their rude retorts. Because I'd seen it with my own eyes. I was there, 
and nothing could shake my faith, except that on this occasion my dad was listening, and he'd, he'd seen this happen before. And finally, he couldn't bear it anymore. <laughs> and he thought it was time to pop the bubble of my innocence and naivety, and he explained the truth about that day. The clandestine trip to the fishmongers that morning. <laughs> How he'd sneaked the fish onto the hook while I was wandering down the bank. How he'd hit it on the head with a stick very quickly. <laughs> Even though it had already been dead for a couple of days. <laughs> and how if I'd looked very carefully, I might have noticed that it was already gutted. <laughs> well, <coughs> I can tell you, I was pretty gutted at this point. <laughs> I went into a big sulk. Uh, but it didn't last long, because you know, I was 15 and I quickly found other things to sulk about. And I also realized that what had happened was a tremendous gift. Probably one of the best things my dad's ever done for me, and he's done a lot of great things. And I've pretty much no doubt at all that I, I wouldn't be standing here today talking about fish to you. And I certainly wouldn't be involved in a campaign to, to protect our oceans from the from the pillaging that's uh, going on globally and giving us so much problems, uh, if it hadn't been for that Richmond Park fish. So what happened that day, thanks to my dad's prank, was I made a connection, and it stayed with me all my life. And we've been talking a lot today about connecting, and I think connecting with food is a wonderful thing, and I think it's something that shouldn't be a privilege but it's something that we're all entitled to do. But it's also something that we need to seek out a little for ourselves. And that mackerel, for me, was the beginning of many, many things. Not just my love of fishing and catching and cooking what I catch, my passion for scuba diving and the other fishy things that I love to do now. But it taught me something about cooking and about food, which is that the best food is food with a good story. The best food is food you feel close to, involved with in some way. And that doesn't mean there has to be a great ripping yarn attached to uh, the story of the food you're eating. But if there's a little story in at least some of the food that you're eating, most days of the week, then I think you're in a good place. I think you're in a good place to enjoy your food more. I think you're in a good place to be eating healthily. And I think you're in an excellent place to be eating sustainably. That story can take many forms. If we travel from our part of the country to see friends in another country, another part of the country, or even another country, if we take with us a, a jar of honey from near where we live, we take something special from our own landscape. Honey is something we take for granted, but it's a really extraordinary food if you think about it. It's, um, it's created immediately uh, from the landscape around us, but, but from many, many different plants. Uh, I was thinking, uh, listening to the incredibly uh, inspirational Satish Kumar this morning, uh, talking about how everything comes from the soil. It's true, of course, and then foods like honey are so symbolic because those bees have been gathering nectar from the area around where you live, bringing it back to the hive, and then you have it all in this jar of honey. It's a little piece of your own landscape. People talk about eating the view, eating the landscape. Well, it's all there in a jar of honey. This feeling of connectedness is also the reason why it's so much nicer to eat a home-baked cake uh, than it is to buy one from a supermarket. But it's also the reason why it's great to get a cake or a loaf of bread from the local baker, to talk to the man or woman who makes the food. And it was lovely to see in the Great Hall today an organic farmer there with his produce. And I saw, uh, I saw vegetables changing hands. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> which always gives me a little frisson. Huh? And what's he got there? <laughs> Is that a handful of leeks? No, can't be. My leek's finished. <laughs> but uh, I know that whoever's gone home with the food from, I think it's Springfield or Organic Farm, um, will have a wonderful meal, and they will feel connected. They'll feel connected to today. It'll remind them of the whole event. Uh, if they're from around here, uh, they'll feel connected to the landscape, to, to, the, to the whole 
community, or if they've come from afar and they take it with them, it'll be special in that way too. So these are the ways that we can connect with our food. Uh, it was E.M. Forster in, in Howard's End, the marvelous phrase, only connect. And food gives us a marvelous opportunity to connect every day. Uh, it's, in Howard's End, the, the theme is very much the connection we feel for people and places and how our lives are absolutely incomplete without that. But every food has a story that involves people and places, and the more we connect with that, the better we can feel about our food. I'm going to talk a little bit more about mackerel, because it is a fish that I'm very deeply obsessed with, and I love now to, to feed it to my family, to take them out fishing, but it's a fish that in many ways we can all connect with. It's the great democratic fish of the British coast, because anyone who's been on a seaside holiday knows that uh, in many harbour ports up and down the country you can jump on a mackerel boat, have a quick one hour, two hour trip around the bay and have a really good chance at catching your own fish. In fact, I'd really like to know how, how many people here have actually done that, have been out, caught a mackerel, cooked it yourself, I think that, that's more than half of you. It's way more than half of you. Anyway, I mean, those of you who've done it could maybe tell the people who haven't. Um, <laughs> go quietly, there's a lot of vegetarians here, I know. But, <laughs> I mean, you know. but just tell them what a wonderful experience that was and that, that smell, that, that, that lovely charcoal, that blistering, that, that, that um, little bit of bay leaf. That it's so, you know, Proust had his madeleines and I've got my mackerel. And I realize that that's very pretentious, but, <laughs> but I am a little bit obsessed with this fish, and this, this fish is very special uh, in, in, in another way too, because he, here's a fish that is extraordinarily successful, hugely abundant. Mackerel are very broad-minded eaters, and believe me, I know a broad-minded eater when I see one, <laughs> but they are fantastically resourceful, they can feed on little marine worms and small things in the bottom of the sea, they can eat little fish in the middle of the sea, anything up to a quarter of their own size, they can snap it and devour it, and when times are hard they can go out looking for plankton, and they're resourceful and uh, hugely abundant as a result of this success. So much so that they have been a bedrock fish of the North Atlantic fishery for, for centuries. And until quite recently, they had the status of being one of the most sustainable fish in the sea. In fact, I've been banging on about people eating more mackerel uh, for a lot recently, uh, until, uh, until very recently. But what, what's happened now is that um, basically the Marine Stewardship Council have estimated that up to 650,000 tonnes of mackerel a year is a sustainable harvest from the uh, Northeast Atlantic. That's an extraordinary amount of fish. And in a way, we can just sort of sigh with gratitude that it's conceivable that we could ever take that amount of fish out of an ocean and sort of get away with it. But, but the scientists reckon that we can. And so uh, that's been the target, the scientific target for a few years. Th what that equates to, incidentally, because I know we've, we've been trying to, to t t t turn numbers today into figures and size, but that, that's basically five or six portions of mackerel per year for every man, woman and child in Europe is a sustainable harvest. But somehow we can't exercise the restraint to leave it at that. And you may have heard there's an almighty row going on about mackerel at the moment. It's, it's between the, the EU plus Norway, one contingent, and the Icelandic and the Faroese, and they're squabbling about the quota levels for this extraordinary fish. And they can't agree so what they do is what people tend to do, particularly when they see uh, things out there that look not only like food, but also look like pound signs, because fish is big money. They think, well, if we can't agree, we'll just take what we think we're entitled to, and you, think, you take what you think you're entitled to, and we'll leave it at that. And that's what's been happening, which means for several years now, They've been exceeding the quotas for, for, for this fish by 30 to 40 percent. And now the Marine Stewardship Council's withdrawing its uh, sustainable label for North uh, East Atlantic mackerel. 
So where does that leave us? I mean, how do we feel about that? As the, the little boy standing on the stream in Richmond Park, you know, that makes me want to cry. It really does. Particularly this beautiful fish that I'm so attached to. Uh, the man in me is feeling rage about this at the moment. It's just absurd. Uh, you know, it can't, it can't be allowed uh, to go on. But what are we going to do? I mean, why, while the politicians are, are wrangling and, and the big fishing industry players are continuing to hoover this fish out of the sea and we just want a simple bit of fish for our supper, uh, how much are we going to worry about it? It's a real problem for me. I, I, and I've decided, my, just for what it's worth, my personal take on this is at the moment is that for, for one more season I'm going to go on uh, fishing and, and cooking and eating mackerel and feeding it to my family. Uh, monitoring, watching the situation. We'll go on uh, serving uh, line caught southwest mackerel uh, in, in, our, in our restaurants for a little while longer. And there's a, a deadline in July coming up where some things might be resolved and it might start to sort itself out. But to be honest, I'm, I'm not holding my breath about that. Uh, so it just seems insane that when there's so much abundance there, we can't seem to, you know, we don't have the grace of a gannet or a shark or a seal to take what's appropriate and leave the rest for another day. And I wonder what you would think now if you were, if you were um, at, uh, given an opportunity to go mackerel fishing late, later in the summer, you know, with your, your children or grandchildren. Uh, would you be worrying about the sustainability dilemma? Uh, these, are the, these are the problems we have to wrestle with as consumers when, when decisions are, feels like decisions are being taken out of our hands. I would say, I would honestly say, go for it. Take them, catch a fish, enjoy it. Allow them that pleasure, that connection of, of catching and cooking something and, and that sense of excitement. Because we need now, we need to raise a new generation uh, who are aware in touch and connected and care where their food comes from. We need to show them how to grow and cook what they grow. Because in the end, the way I see it, we're all on a continuum. Right over here, at one extreme, total dependence on the industrial food machine. We never touch food. We never touch raw ingredients. It's plastic packaged. It goes into the microwave, ping, straight into our mouths. Right over at the other end of this continuum, the hunter-gatherer, not many of them left, the Kalahari Bushmen, maybe a few tribes in the Amazon. And we're all somewhere in the middle, shifting along this continuum. And my contention is very simple. We need to move in this direction, a little bit, finding food stories, things that thrill us and inspire us, connecting with our neighbours and communities through food. We don't have to know all the stats and facts about sustainability, helpful though they are at times to, to, to get that sense of urgency that's required. If we look, if we seek out the local, the seasonal, food with a good story, food grown and created by people with names, we will be building sustainable food communities. And if we build our own and others build them as well, we will have a sustainable food future. Thank you very much.